This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on in to Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. As we are getting you set for week nine of NFL from a betting perspective, joined by Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus to get his favorite bets for week number nine. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here as always by Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and find him on Twitter at ThePowerRank. Ed, happy Halloween to you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, excited to talk another NFL and to, uh, you know, go trick or treating in the rain with my boys or maybe snow. Yeah, I saw I follow a lot of people uh, who live in Chicago still. And I woke up this morning, opened my Twitter and saw snow. And I was like, OK, so we're there now. That's great. Yep. I'm excited for this. We're there. Yeah. Uh, so do you dress up to go trick or treating personally? Yeah, I'm not going to, you know, like there's some years that I have, um, yeah. I usually like to use Halloween as a chance to do some kind of art. There was one year I painted, uh, a stormtrooper helmet as a globe, which is pretty awesome. Definitely yeah. one of the coolest things I've ever done, but you know, it's kind of been a busy year. Uh, you know, no thanks to you, Jim. In the podcast. <laughs> So, so no costume this year, uh, which, which is fine. I'll take the mea culpa there for sure. Uh, are you an art guy generally? Uh, kind of. I mean, yeah. I feel like I like, like I like to do art just to get my mind away from work. Right. You know, it feels like it's a good creative outlet. Am I good yeah. at it? Probably not. Um, but I like to go to art museums, which yeah. is, uh, you know, which is fun for me. Um, uh, still trying to drag my kids there, which is, which is a battle, but <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm an art guy. That's yeah. that's too much. Yeah, I don't think I have the patience. Like I like looking at art, but I get I I'm very scatterbrained, and I don't think I generally have the patience. Uh, I appreciate art and enjoy right. looking at it, but I uh, I'm a little too uh, like I just can't pay attention very long. I think is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so definitely not on my alley. Uh, but. I think that I always appreciate people who appreciate art. So maybe we'll Well, get... I mean, there's there's many kinds of art. Like every one of your daily shots when you're on your that's own true. and scripting it, that's that's a work of art in my mind. So Okay. So, so we all do art. It, it's just how you view it. I'm an artist. So whenever yep. I have to explain my job at parties, which is the weirdest thing to try to explain on the planet. Um, really? Oh, I, I can never explain it because I'm like, you probably don't know what daily fantasy is. So it's like... Uh oh. I don't know how I explain this to you. Uh, and I just assume that they will like talk about weird things with me. So I try Can't to you just say I'm a sports writer and podcaster. If, if you're in like the non DFS kind of that would work out pretty well. Yeah. I, I usually try to... the whole data science thing and I might need, I mean, to I try really should that. try the sports writer and podcaster thing, but I, I, I try to get into the, like, I'm a data scientist that, you know, makes football predictions. I'm a nerd who sits in front of my computer and reads spreadsheets all day. I think that works out pretty well, too. Speaking of people and spreadsheets and data science, we're going to talk to Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus to get his thoughts on week nine of the NFL. You can find Eric's work on PFF Greenline and also he's the host of the PFF Forecast Podcast. You can follow Eric on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. Yesterday, we ran through week 10 of college football uh, with Ed, and we talked about his numbers, his adjusted success rate numbers, why they're helpful for betting and for more, because I think success rate numbers are pretty widely applicable. To find that episode and get our thoughts on Week 10 of College Football, make sure you find Covering the Spread and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. You can find us there. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well. I also forgot we had the World Series last night, uh, which yeah. was pretty wild. Were you able to stay up until the end? Because I, I get yeah. like... It was it wasn't the shortest game. It went pretty fast initially, but it slowed down at the end. Yeah, you know, it was a long day and I was kind of like, "Yeah, I should really go to bed." Yeah. Do some more prep for some stuff. But then I thought back to like years when I was a kid and like my parents made me go to bed. Yeah. During World Series game 7, I was like, "Screw it, man. I'm staying up. <laughs> I'm rebelling." And you then, can't make me go to bed. Yeah, no one can make me go to bed. I I I mean, <laughs> I'd like to cuz I'm old, but right. I was like, "No. Damn it, I'm doing it." And then yeah. the Nationals scored their sixth run. I was like, all right, you know. Right. I'm going to hit the sack. I uh, wanted to watch just for Max Scherzer because I have, like, a folder on my computer dedicated to Max Scherzer gifts. Yeah, I saw, some, I saw you posted some of that. that was, they're uh, so good. I have one gif where he is just swearing up a storm. 
uh, on the mound as he's about to throw a pitch. And I have a subtitled version, which is the NSFF or NSFW version. But I also have one, like if I'm put, posting it in Slack at work, I can't put that version in there because like there are some bad words in that, uh, in that right. little thing. So I have a clean version as well. And thankfully, Max was... He's very nice. Let us add to the the Max Scherzer gift collection last night. I think it's the 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 Mount Rushmore of sports gifts. It's Philip Rivers one. That's not questioned. Doc <laughs> Rivers is probably two. I think Max Scherzer is three, and the fourth spot is to be determined. Uh, maybe Nick Young. I don't know. We can <laughs> we can figure this out. But I think that those three have to be on there. So it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I was rooting for the Nats. Uh, just a combination of various things. Yeah. I, I still am monitoring the MVP race because we talked about Alex Bregman for MVP back in like August. He was 13 mm, yeah. to one. He might get it. I think it should be trout, but but people don't always vote rationally. So uh, right. we might be able to talk about that uncovering the past in just a bit. But first we have to go back to week eight and talk about some NFL bets with Dr. Bob. Bob Stoll uh, covered week eight of the NFL with us. We'll go back through those and then get set for week number nine. Covering the past. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Dr. Bob, Bob Stoll. You can find him on Twitter at Dr. Bob Sports on to preview week eight of the NFL. And one of the games we discussed was Carolina plus five and a half against the 49ers. And the 49ers, I think, just kind of proved that they're pretty legit. A really impressive win there for them. And they did cover there. Uh, he had a lean on the Chiefs plus three and a half against the Packers. We're going to talk more about the game with Dr. Eric Eager as well in his segment because it was a pretty tight game. But the Packers did cover there too. But uh, Eric was on uh, the Chiefs plus three and a half there also. Mentioned the Bills minus two and a half. The Eagles won that game outright. Bit of a statement game for them and a big victory for them too. So impressive win there for Philadelphia as they covered. And both you and Dr. Bob had the Chargers plus three and a half. And that one worked out. And it, they would have covered even if the Bears had made their field goal at the end. And of course yeah. they didn't because it's the Bears. But I still feel like I have no grasp on the Chargers. But you, you did get that one right there. Well, I mean, like I said last week, it's one of those games that you kind of want to throw up in your mouth as you're <laughs> telling it on the podcast. And I forget where I was, but I was kind of checking it on my phone. Yeah. Uh, and Ch Chicago's coming down. They're clearly not going to cover, which is right. it's like, phew, you know, like, right. great. But then, you know, I mean, I still have like Chicago under nine wins that I sent to my members. Um, yep. Uh, before the season started and like, you know, I mean, there's a couple wins they have, especially that Denver game that they yeah. had no right winning probably should have won this game, but you know, then they blow the field goal. So now they're sitting at uh three and four, nine wins is looking further away. Um, so, and now, you know, they're, I think they're at Philly this week, pretty big yeah. dog. Um, so, uh, the regression that we, that we thought for the bears is, is definitely happening. And, um, so it was a double win on Sunday. Absolutely. And they it's tough when you have an under and on a team like that and you get a cheap win that goes in their favor. Yep. That makes it, it it makes things a lot more aggravating. So thankfully things reverted back. It was self inflicted that they lost that game because partially coaching, partially Trubisky being Trubisky, which was the thought <laughs> process behind, I'm sure, betting the under there. Uh, so good call by you there. I wanted the under, or sorry, the over on Jets-Jaguars. The total is 41 and a half, and it actually did go down. Uh, so I did, I got negative line movement, but it actually did go over. Uh, 29 to 15, the final score there. So that one did still go over. And a lot of it was because injuries to the Jets' defense, injuries to uh, the Jaguars' defense. Jets didn't play all that well, uh, but it did still go over. And the pace was a, a big part of it, too. The Jets did slow down a bit more in that game, which is disappointing. But uh, that one did go over. So overs totals going pretty well so far this year. We're going to talk about a couple more totals with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus in just one second. But first... If you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
Let's bring on Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. We'll have a couple of dueling PhDs on this podcast between Ed and Eric. And Eric is, of course, a data scientist who writes up their weekly NFL picks for PFF Greenline and hosts the PFF Forecast podcast. Let's break down number nine, week number nine of the NFL with Dr. Eric Eager. Covering the present. Let's bring Dr. Eric Eager into covering the spread, talking a little bit of NFL this time. We had Eric on to talk college football last time. Of course, Eric is a data scientist at Pro Football Focus. You can find his work on the PFF Forecast podcast and also on PFF Greenline. Eric, happy Halloween. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. i getting to work the second half of the day from home, so you can't complain about that. No, absolutely. Do you have any big plans for Halloween tonight? Uh, I normally go where they send me, uh, as far as, uh, my, my two daughters and my wife. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much the, uh, a, a supplementary complimentary player tonight. And is, are it, you... is it raining, raining down there? It, it has been raining most of the day, uh, but it has stopped. So okay. we'll see oh, okay. how that goes. So yeah, our rain crossed. up here in Ann Arbor is supposed to turn into snow, which I'm very excited about. Man, I, yeah, w- w- this is not, you know, Jim knows this, but you know this is not Minnesota, so we don't we don't get <laughs> snow this time until probably probably uh, Thanksgiving is the next holiday where we'll probably have snow. Yep, I remember last year we kept track of the snow days we had here in Syracuse, uh, and we had I think like sixty days with snow, and there were like eleven in November, and November is tomorrow, so I am already preparing for it. In Minnesota, it was like cold enough where like it wouldn't snow all that often, uh, which was weird. But in Syracuse, it snows literally every day. That's like, like weird to explain to people that it's too yeah. cold to snow sometimes. Yeah. But like, yeah, it, it's funny. It's very weird. Uh, do you have like a Halloween costume you wear when you're going around with your kids? No, and in fact, like you know, my parents stopped letting me go to Halloween when I was in like sixth grade, <laughs> so I really wasn't a Halloween person. However, my first year of graduate school. One of my good friends went as Colt McCoy, and I went as a head coach, and we went as the difference between the Vikings and a Super Bowl. So that was like the one the one time I did a, a Halloween costume, you know, since uh, you know very young. Oh my goodness! That's a, didn't you go to grad school in Nebraska? I did, but like I was the you know the resident Vikings fan there at okay. the time. Okay. And uh, he ran him, and I. The joke was always the Vikings were a head coach and a quarterback away, and so we figured out we'd make that into a costume. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say a uh, Colt McCoy dressed as or dressing as Colt McCoy in Lincoln might be kind of dangerous. Well, there was that one play where he threw the ball out of bounds in the Big Twelve yes. time back when they were in the Big Twelve, Absolutely. and there was the one second that they gave back to the Longhorns, and it ended up being the the death now. And I don't think Nebraska's really ever recovered. No, <laughs> and, and like again, we talked about this before on the podcast. People in Lincoln are the nicest humans on the planet, but. Colt McCoy might get them to change that. So definitely uh, <laughs> testing the waters there for sure. But Eric, let's dive in here and talk a little bit about PFF Greenline. And we talked about it from a college perspective last time. But when you look at the the pro side, every team has an ELO rating, and that is listed in the page on PFF Greenline. And I'm not asking you to like devolve like state secrets here, but like, what are some of the key factors that go into developing that ELO rating? Yeah, I mean, the ELO algorithm is pretty public. I mean, we use kind of a um, a version of what 538 does, which is basically the scores of the game uh, adjusted for what was expected in the game, uh, whether the game was played at a neutral site or, or in a, a home stadium, and, and then sort of like what the margin of victory means, and then you update the ELO rating in such a way that the teams come out with basically a, a, an average of zero change every week. Um, the, the thing that's different about us is we go through – and we change what we think the score of the game is going to be. Uh, and I know that you know folks, you know folks in the betting space do this all the time with game grades and everything. And we just simply use the PFF grades to do that. So, um, for example, if you have a game where um, one team just outperforms the other, our grades for their pass protection, our grades for their coverage, our grades for their quarterback play are just substantially more than the than the uh, than the team on the other side. They're probably going to win the game by a margin bigger than what the actual score of the game was. Uh, and then conversely, there are going to be some games where a team's ELO rating is going to go down, even though they won because they were outplayed by the other team. Um, you know, this, this Sunday we have a game in London. I remember a season ago when the Titans lost to the Chargers in London, we actually graded the, the Titans as a better team that day 
than the, than the Chargers. So actually, their ELO rating went up, and the Chargers went down for that one. So that's just an example, and and you know, it's basically just us taking historical data and saying, okay, a team that grades this way generally scores this many points. A team that grades that that way generally will score that many points, and then what what that ends up being, uh, and and that's sort of worked for us so far. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Eric, last time you were on the show, you were telling us about the PFF grades, and and you kind of blew my mind with the things that you were telling me about Dwayne Haskins. I kind of thought of him as a great quarterback, uh, very productive in the college level, and you were kind of like, no, 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 no. It's kind of the the, the types of passes that he threw in college. Um, they tend to be easy passes, these wheel routes, these these crossing routes. Um, and we've seen that it's been difficult for him to get off the bench in, in Washington, a team that's not exactly lighting the world on fire. I also wanted to ask you, what did the PFF grade say about Daniel Jones uh, at Duke and, and now that he's going to the New York Giants? Yeah, in, in most of the ways in which we evaluate the situation, we liked Haskins more than Jones. But with all the reservations that were accorded uh, to Haskins, it was, you know, the, the issue with Jones is it's always hard to answer the entanglement problem. When a quarterback does not play with any NFL caliber players, the opportunity space for him is smaller than when somebody like Haskins. I mean, we look at Terry McLaurin right now. He's one of the best rookie receivers in the NFL, if not the best. And he wasn't necessarily even the most highly regarded person that Haskins was throwing to last year. Right. Uh, so that that's the tricky part. But yeah, we liked Jones last season was our 21st graded quarterback in terms of passing grade, uh, whereas Haskins was 11th. Uh, Haskins was graded right below Gardner Minshew, right below Brett Rippon, right below Ryan Finley, uh, three guys who will probably be starting relatively soon. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, obviously Trevor Lawrence was fifth, Tua Tagovailoa fourth, and somebody who was also struggled at the NFL level, at least in the preseason, Will Greer was third for us, and then Murray was first. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we did certainly not give him the a, a plus grade for those tap passes that ended up being touchdowns. Um, some of the yards after the catch that they were getting on the crossers to guys like Paris Campbell were, were not upgraded. Um, but, but some of the stuff that Daniel Jones was doing was that was significantly getting downgraded. Um, mm -hmm. And so we ended up with a lower grade on Jones than Haskins, but both guys, we were not necessarily, you know, pounding the table for to be top 10 picks. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I'm looking at some of Duke's numbers. Uh, you know, my argument against him was always, you know, he didn't get it done at the college football level. Duke's offense and adjusted yards per play was very near FBS average in the mm -hmm. 60s. Well, Duke's offense is 109th right now. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, maybe maybe he had, you know, maybe there was a lot of things that he was doing well uh, that should have been appreciated. Yeah. And that being said, though, he at the NFL level has not been terrible. Like he obviously looks like right. – he can survive, but sure. he's producing a lot of turnover worthy plays. He's, he's being negatively graded quite a bit on a, a lot of his throws. Um, so while I think he looks like a young quarterback should look, it's not like he's lighting the world on fire. Um, right. but also the same thing can be said. I mean, Kyler Murray looks like an NFL quarterback, but he's not necessarily, uh, you know, playing as well as Baker Mayfield did in the last stretch of the season last year, uh, or a guy like Deshaun Watson did during his first seven games. So, um, Whereas Haskins, when he's played, has so far looked like he doesn't belong in the NFL. So it's just a really interesting, right. uh, I think, for all of these players. And, and, and Ed, you had uh, Kevin Cole on your podcast this week. It's sort of one of those where we say, OK, where was the guy drafted? Um, let's add some yep. uncertainty to it. And then as the time space evolves, let's see how this goes. And I think for every single one of these guys, uh, it's a wait and see. And we yeah. may get to see Drew Locke as well at some point. Uh, Drew Locke, another pretty pol polarizing guy. So what we've got you here, uh, you don't need to like, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here because we did not prepare you to talk about Drew Locke, but we'll probably see him probably within the next three or four weeks. Sounds like the plan is for him to be active in week 11. Uh, what did PFF have to say about Drew Locke coming out? He graded 12, so he's right behind Haskins. The The issue with Locke is really what the, at the core of some of the modeling decisions you have to make when projecting college to pro, because Haskins, you have no choice. You have one season's worth of play, and that's right. basically what you have to build off of. With Locke, what you have is four years of play, two of which were bad, like <laughs> legitimately bad quarterback play at the at the college level. And then the last two were increasingly better to the point where I would say Drew Locke was a decent college quarterback last season, all things told. But do you disregard like do you do you disregard what Locke did in those three years? Do you, what do you do for the um, the counterfactual with mm -hmm. Haskins? If he would have played over JT Barrett, would he have you know, done as poorly or as well as Locke? So 
you know, I know Football Outsiders QB base just ignores seasons. I believe with a with a below a certain threshold in terms of yards per play. I believe, um, whereas you know we I, I think would take into account way you know way those seasons uh, somewhat in our projection model. It's just a really interesting question. So for me, I don't I didn't like Locke as a first round pick just because of his right. accuracy issues. Um, even last season in his good year, he completed less than sixty three percent of his passes. Um, uh, despite having, you know, playing in the SEC and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, I where he was picked, I thought it was a good pick because, you know, second round picks in the NFL, especially there was their second of two, uh, you know, they're they're much more of the, you know, let's shoot for the shoot for the high variance there. And so at that position, I hate I didn't like the pick at all. Yeah, right. I didn't, so, I didn't hate the pick at all. Sorry. Right. Yeah. And so, it's kind of yeah. like in my mind, it's kind of like getting Josh Allen at 40 picks later, basically, Correct. because he's athletic. Yeah got a big arm he might suck but he might not so i thought i thought that it was interesting where he was taken as well and and you right and you can do a lot so like i take like dalton reisner was picked right ahead uh, of drew lock and dalton reisner at his best is probably going to generate during the course of his career if he's a very good guard for uh denver probably a win above replacement um and as bad as Andy Dalton has been at times for the Bengals, he was worth about half a win above replacement this season. And so like just the quarterback position, just being there and being a player that plays, you generate a ton of value. Right. And so with a pick in that, in that part of the draft, uh, they could have done a lot worse than Drew Locke. So Eric, you just have to go get Kevin Cole to uh, do his Bayesian analysis on college quarterbacks, (laughs) giving your guys his grades. And then your prior can be the the recruiting rankings. So we'll get him right. on that, right? That's right. That's right. We could start with like high school stats even if we want to. <laughs> well, you guys got a grade. I mean, you guys got a grade the high school. So I don't know if you guys are at that level. Yet, but. <laughs> Eric, also wanted to ask you about um, the QB situation in Kansas City. Uh, Pat Mahomes is injured. He may play this week. He may not. Uh, we had Matt Moore last week who, who looked pretty good. Um, how does your so- system account for that when you're looking at that in green line? Uh, so when I, when I saw this question, I, I put, well, we had Kansas city plus four, so obviously not good enough. Um, but <laughs> you know, I think anybody that watched that game would know that like, you know, that probably plus four was a fair price, I would say, yeah. um, for that game. Um, but the way that it was constructed was really interesting. So we had Mahomes last season as about a 3.7 wins above replacement player, which is the highest in the NFL. Oh. And so if you translate in, that into points per game, over a replacement quarterback, he would be worth about eight points against the spread. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw that game open about three and a half, four uh, on a look ahead, all the way to five is where it closed. Um, and so that's right in the ballpark there. The interesting thing, though, was that Matt Moore was not a replacement level quarterback on Sunday, you know, and, <laughs> right. and at his best, uh, you know, 2011 Miami Dolphins, he was worth about 1.5 wins above replacement in a, in a stint in, in the stead of another Chiefs backup quarterback, Chad Henney. Um, and Alex Smith, during his worst years in Kansas City, was roughly that number. And so if you think about, OK, what's the coach's influence on a quarterback? That might be what more could be worth for the Chiefs if he were to be able to play for an extended amount of time, in which case the he should be you know worth about maybe two and a half points. And, and the downgrade from Mahomes to more should be more like five and a half points. Uh, and that was really, you know, that wasn't necessarily our calculus going in. I mean, we don't explicitly put how many points a quarterback's worth when we fold in the stuff into our model, but that's what it ended up shaking out as. We had, we, our number on Kansas City was more like two and a half on Sunday night. And that's why we, you know, thought Kansas City plus four was a good play. Didn't end up working out, but it was still sort of, I think, process wise made a lot of sense. Yeah, we had Dr. Bob on last week, and he also said Kansas City, it was plus three and a half at the time, and he liked that number too because he thought that the look-ahead line, it just kind of overcorrected uh, for that. And a lot of it was based on the system that Andy Reid runs giving us a different map more than what we saw in Miami, and it sounds like you were along the same line of thought there. Yeah, we, we do a coaching metric, and you know, and Andy Reid is traditionally our highest graded coach on a play for play basis. So he just gets more. What we do is we take the grades and we say, okay, how many expected points should this play have netted? And then how many do they get? And, and you know, you <laughs> aggregate that over the course of a season, you throw out 
um, you know, uh, noisy type of plays. And Andy Reid always seems to be out on top. The issue with Reid has always been clock management right. and determining when to kick or or not kick on fourth down, which is really what, what was his, uh, you know, death nail on Sunday night. But on a play for play basis, it didn't surprise me that the Chiefs were effective offensively. Uh, I mean, honestly, the, the difference in the game was that Shady McCoy still holds the ball like a loaf of bread in between the tackles. So um, well, and that the, was really the, the, what killed the, the Chiefs against the Packers. Well, and they couldn't tackle Aaron Jones on a pretty simple screen route. So, <laughs> well, and one of the things that we'll probably talk about when we talk about the Packers game is what was, what's been most impressive about Green Bay has been their ability to script plays. So the first 15 plays of the, of the game, they're one of the most efficient teams in the NFL. What was awesome to see about um, the Fleur as a head coach was Kansas City had figured out their offense in the second quarter, and they made a secondary adjustment to target the Chiefs linebackers, which is really a, an impressive thing, uh, you know, uh, in the second half. And they really just, I mean, it was something like 11 for 11 for 180 yards throwing on those three linebackers. So uh, it was really a great adjustment by the rookie head coach. So before we move into Texans Jags, uh, do you have any thoughts on Vikings Chiefs? Two teams you know a lot about, obviously. Uh, do you have? A, you don't have to give a pick here, but just a, an overall thought on that game. Right now, the Vikings are favored by two and a half. We won't hold you to this. Just curious yeah. for your thoughts, given how much you know about the two teams. For me, I think it's Vikings or nothing, just because the Vikings offensively offer a lot of the same things that the Packers do. They have a dynamic running back who can catch the ball in the backfield. Um, you know, even the Packers, frankly, didn't have their best receiver on Sunday night football uh, and still were able to, to throw effectively. The Vikings might not have their most effective receiver on, on Sunday, but they will have Stefan Diggs, uh, even if they're without Thielen. So I think on that side of the ball, the Vikings will probably have some success. And the Vikings defense, I think, is still a better unit than, than Green Bay's um, and has historically done really well against non-elite quarterbacks under Mike Zimmer. So. It's really hard. I think, you know, there's always a chance of Mahomes plays. And frankly, we thought that he there was a, a non-trivial chance he would have played last week. And one of the reasons we picked the game. Um, so it, it mostly for me, if if Matt Moore plays, I think you lay you lay the points with Minnesota. If if Mahomes plays as kind of injured, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see where the line ends up ends right. up going, probably more towards a pick them even to Kansas City minus one or so. All right, let's move on here to the Texans at the Jaguars. This game is uh, one of the ones you mentioned over in London. Texans are one-point favorites here. The total is down to 46, and we've got a pretty good sample on Gardner Minshew now as a Jaguars quarterback, keeping with the rookie quarterback trend here. Uh, what's been your read on Minshew through those first eight games? Minshew has been the most valuable rookie in the NFL this year, according to War, which is cool because he's a quarterback so he's only going to be going up against a few other quarterbacks but he's generated more value than Kyler Murray which is kind of cool you know in terms right. of you know you almost always you almost always need to be a first round pick to have value at the quarterback position however i think weirdly he's still being i think he's still being overvalued right now and and so when they played in week 2 jacks we like jacksonville plus 9 it closed at plus 7 7 and a half um so on a neutral field that's about 4 and a half um, I, we, people think that Jacksonville has this huge home field advantage in London, but it's really only been about a point over the course of that, that history. So the game's about three in that regard. If you don't adjust Minshew for the last, you know, two months or so, but I'm going to argue that I think Deshaun Watson's a far better has moved in the, in a, in a direction more speedily than, uh, than Minshew has. And here's the reason I think the first two weeks of the season and last season, Deshaun Watson was the most pressured quarterback in the NFL. Uh, and, and we know that pressure rate is, is hugely dependent upon who the quarterback is. Since week two, he's only been the 22nd highest pressured quarterback in the NFL. And since week five, it's more like 27th, 28th. So whatever's happening in that offense, Deshaun Watson is fundamentally protecting himself to a point where I think it's elevated his play. Um, and from a clean pocket, he's suffered 12 drops this year from his receivers. So I think, mm. like, in a weird way, the undervalued quarterback in this game is Deshaun Watson. Huh. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> and, right. I, you know, and the, the Texans do this weird thing where they don't cover the spread against Oakland. They struggle to win against Indianapolis. Um, you know, they, uh, they, they, they lost to Carolina. And, but at the same time, if you look at how Watson's playing, I mean, they, he's making, like, superstars out of players like Darren Fells, right? I right. mean, Kenny Stills has been injured for part of the time. Will Fuller's been injured for part of the time. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is having like more drops than last season, and they're still getting the job done offensively. Their defense is a little bit rough, but I think the weather plays into this. Uh, Minshew's you know been a little bit limited with a shoulder injury uh, this week, so 
for my money, I like Houston. I like Houston here. I just think from a numbers play, it makes a lot of sense. So let's talk more about Deshaun Watson because I think that while we have you here, it's smart to utilize your knowledge of quarterbacks. And I think it was the Atlanta game. His time to throw dipped like half a second in a week, and it was very weird to see. Do you think that is a schematic change on the Texans' part? Is that Deshaun Watson just being more mindful of the hurries he's uh, welcoming in, or, or is that sustainable? Or how are you viewing that for right now? I think it's all the, all the above, but I do, I do think it's one of those things where he is, he is very, um, he's, he's altering the way he's playing the game. Um, and you see it in some of the underlying things. His completion percentage is near 70% this year. Um, he's less high variance. Uh, you know, his negatively graded throw rate is still relatively high for a player of his caliber, but um, is down from a season ago. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think has really been awesome about him is He's, I believe, our highest, second highest graded running quarterback um, behind uh, Dak Prescott. And we're talking more about scrambles. So Lamar Jackson's right. up there, but not you know, he's so much of a more a designed player. But what that all, what that does so well for the Texans offense, they don't have a great offensive line. And yet Carlos Hyde, who every team seemed to want to release uh, the last few years, is effective. Right. I mean, and what I think what what leads to that is how effective Watson can be as a runner, as a designed runner, they, he has to be accounted for in the box. And that has opened up holes for Carlos Hyde, which has led to things like either, you know, avoiding third down altogether or giving them really manageable third downs. Mm -hmm. And we've been on, uh, we've been against Deshaun Watson betting, betting on him, you know, in every game except for last season when they played Jacksonville. And I'm telling you what, the, the, the thing that I hate the most, and we were on the Falcons in that game you were talking about, the thing I hate the most is third down with Deshaun Watson in the ball. Yeah. You know, he's just, <laughs> he demoralizes you as a defense for all the things he can do, escapability. I mean, he got kicked in the face and threw a touchdown pass last week. I mean, he's just, there's so many things about him that make him otherworldly that, um, you know, when it comes to a game like this, I think to myself, yeah, there's a lot of injuries on Houston side. There's also a lot of injuries on Jacksonville side. To me, it's just you, you lay a point with with Deshaun Watson and and you 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 forget it. Uh, you know, and fun fun thing about this game is it's standalone, so you get to watch him anyway. But right. like, um, it, it to me that this is the the matchup where I think for once he's undervalued. Excellent. Let's move on to Packers or Chargers. Uh, Packers are a three point favorite here. The total is at forty seven. Uh, Aaron Rodgers has been has been good this year, and the Chargers defense, um, you know, their pass defense has just been dreadful. What are you seeing in this game? Yeah, this is a great this is a great one because it's one of those where I think the market is really caught up to where numbers based folks like us would be. So, for example, the total was forty seven. Now it's forty eight. I think that's probably a fair number. Um, the spread is weird because it's really hard to pin down in a game like this where a team like the Packers, much like right. the Steelers are going to travel a lot of fans. Uh, so it, they could even have a home field advantage in this game. Um, you, so one of the places we looked and, and on our podcast, the PFF forecast this morning we talked about is sort of an, a, an undervalued place to look for, um, for totals, which is first half team totals. Um, uh, I post a graphic every week of how teams do in scripted plays uh, first 15 plays. And as I talked about earlier, the Packers, generate almost I believe it's like two thirds of an expected play in the passing game in their first 15 plays of games which is an enormous amount the league average is about a tenth of a point on a passing play hmm. um, and they pass the ball more than every team in scripted plays except for Kansas City and turn that over to the other side of the ball the Chargers are giving up 0.4 expected points per early or per early game passing play so to me, if I'm looking to bet this game, there's one place I'm looking to bet, and it's Packers over 13 team total first half. There, there's just so much there to me uh, in terms of like you know the matchup there. You're not betting a first quarter because you're worried about the coin flip and all that kind of stuff. But you give the Packers three or four possessions in the first half of that game, and I think they get two touchdowns against this Chargers defense. Uh, any thoughts on uh, you know Chargers uh, fired their offensive coordinator Ken Wisenhunt? Is that factor into your analysis in any way, or do you need to wait and see? I think it speeds it up a little bit. I think um, you know the Chargers his last season were one of those teams where they were extremely efficient, but they were also slow. So they, their games played under a lot more than than a team with that like sort of quarterback and skill position player talent would would imply. I think that they continue to be slow. Uh, but they're less efficient this year. Um, one of the things that they, you know, with a new offensive coordinator that they probably should do if they're self-scouting at all is try to 
pick up the tempo a little bit and, and use the fact if you have Phillip Rivers on his last year, I'd rather him throw 40 passes than 30 passes, especially with a run game with Melvin Gordon that clearly isn't working. Um, they, I think they, they should probably speed it up, in which case, you know, I, I – like I said, I think the first the first half total is also probably something I'd bet over, although it's moved from 22 and a half to 23 and a half uh, throughout the week. Yeah. And with Mike Pouncey out, the ground game is probably not going to get a lot better. So it makes sense to be a bit more pass happy there. Let's move on to the Sunday night marquee game between the Patriots and the Ravens. I am beyond excited to watch this game. We get yep. Lamar Jackson against Bill Belichick and the Patriots defense has been truly elite thus far, but I would say, at least to me, this is the best offense they've played. I think that given how good the Patriots have been, their schedule doesn't matter all that much. Like, they'd be good against anyone at this point. But can they keep up that dominance against a very good and a very unique offense? You bring you, – the uniqueness is the huge thing, right? If you look at, like, the tendencies that the Ravens have, they run 11 personnel – less than a lot of teams, right? They, they're bigger than a lot of teams offensively, but they face a loaded box less than most teams. So somehow they have these teams in a position where they don't get to just stack the box against Lamar Jackson because they know he can burn them with a big play. Um, but at the same time, like the they the the uh, Ravens still get to block with a bunch of tight ends up front and still be efficient in the run game. It's It's a pretty awesome offense. And one of the cool things is, you know, we talk about the difference between passing efficiency and rushing efficiency. But one of the real things that passing has for it is like you don't have to go through the line of scrimmage, right? And going through the line of scrimmage causes, you know, uh, players to be you know, players to be hit. It causes, you know, everybody to need to make a solid block. You know this, you know, from your offensive lineman analysis. It's just easier to pass block than it is to run block because, you know, uh, success to the fifth power is a lot lower than success to the first power, right? So the, it, it, but Lamar Jackson turns all that math on its head. Right. Lamar Jackson on, on designed runs averages more yards before contact, before he's touched, than, than I believe half of the teams in the NFL average per carry alone. So he just <laughs> – that offense just – you know, and you think about that, like the first time Lamar Jackson is touched, you can sort of think of them as air yards in the passing game. Like yeah. it, it, it his his runs are a lot like passes in their efficiency. And so that's going to be really hard for the Patriots to catch up with. The thing that I like about New England, however, is they use defensive backs liberally enough where they're not going to be in a situation where uh, adding a spy to their defense is going to be super prohibitive to them. They play run defense with a lot of defensive backs. They play pass defense with a lot of defensive backs. And, and so for me, for my money, I think what they're going to, they're going to have the best chance of any team to stop this Ravens offense. Now, whether they do or not is another story. If you're looking on the other side of the ball though, the, the, the Ravens, I think people are overvaluing their defense right now just because they've given up so much in the front seven in free agency uh, and injury that, um, you know, the, the Pats might just – the Pats might turn James White into like, a, you know, a, the second coming of Marshall Falk or, or uh, Thurman Thomas on Sunday night uh, and, and not face so much resistance. Interesting. And the thing with Lamar Jackson, like from an expected points perspective, a Lamar Jackson rush, whether it's a scramble or a design rush, I think is worth like, it's like 0. 0.5 or 0. 0.6 expected <laughs> points, which is like more than a Pat Mahomes drop back, which is like kind of nuts. Oh, and like, yeah. it just changes the equation so much. It's yeah. And quarterback running is tough because there's this observation issue, like a quarterback run is a sack until it's not, you know, right. so, so there's, a, there's some, le you know, right skew in this there, but, but the design runs aren't the design runs are legitimately runs. And you're right. They're, they're worth a substantial amount of expected points. And the thing that we have to be cautious with the Baltimore is that they haven't, their schedule is also pretty, I mean, they're a Juju Smith Schuster fumble in overtime away from being in second place in that division to Pittsburgh without a yeah. starting quarterback. So you know, they're, they've been impressive, but there's been some things that have buoyed them a little bit, you know, namely getting to play the Bengals, uh, the Cardinals, <laughs> the Dolphins, right? Like we're all in this, we're all in this role right now of trying to decide which teams are legitimate. And we apply a lot of like, uh, corrections to teams like the Niners and the Patriots. And we sometimes stop, don't forget to stop and look at the Ravens who are extremely impressive, but have also had their fair share of luck too. I mean, that, that game in Seattle if if Russell Wilson doesn't throw a pick six to Marcus Peters while they're ahead by seven, that game might be a, a drastically different than than what it ended up being. So um, I'm really interested to see because, again, the cool thing about the AFC 
is that the Ravens, the the Chiefs, uh, and the Houston all have to play uh, New England, and and they probably also have to root for New England to get the two seed themselves. Right. Um, and, and a team like Kansas City has already lost to uh, Houston and Indianapolis and beaten Baltimore. So there's all these like head-to-head matchups that are really going to matter once it comes playoff time for who's going to get that two seed. Yeah. Uh, do you have a lean on this game, or is it just an efficient line to you? Uh, I think I would lay three with New England. Um, just for the reasons I said, I think New England's being undervalued because of the schedule. I think the Ravens are not being necessarily as properly valued because of the schedule. Right. I think by weeks, and, and granted, this might go out the window for well-coached teams like the Ravens, who are very well-coached. But bye weeks tend to elicit more rust sometimes than they do rest. Uh, and so that might be an issue. Uh, and then for me, it's all about, okay, you look at the, you look at the mismatches here. Julian Edelman is viewed as a slot player, but he has actually played almost as many, uh, snaps on the outside this season as has in the slot. He's far less redundant with Muhammad Sanu as people think. And then, uh, you know, the Patriots basically played the first month of the season without a tight end. Benjamin Watson has been pretty effective since he joined the team, uh, again, uh, week six or seven. So, um, that, uh, and, and in addition to their front seven for the Ravens being really weak, I think that the Patriots will get uh, their fair share uh, of opportunities here. And so as long as they can not be the absolute disaster against Lamar Jackson, I think they cover this. All right. Uh, any other bets you see you like on the board for week number nine, Eric? Um, yeah, well, so like, let's just start with tonight. I think tonight's game is going to be a little bit more high scoring than people think. Uh, I, depending upon where you look, 42 and a half, 43, um, you know, uh, San Francisco, Arizona. Um, and then I think another one that's sort of sneaky um, during during the, the Sunday games is Seattle, Tampa Bay. I think that game goes under uh, Seattle is for one. Seattle wants to run the football. Tampa Bay has been one of the best, if not the best run defenses in the NFL, uh, sort of behind the scenes this season. Um, Seattle's played a lot of games under because they get ahead and they end up running the football uh, and, and sort of. Um, you know, let the game sort of clock away. And then I think Tampa Bay is really going to, after basically 11 turnovers in the last two games, are really going to want to run the football and keep the ball out of Jameis Winston's hands so much. And so I think that game plays under uh, more than than people realize with two, you know, one really good quarterback and one high variance quarterback. I think it's going to scare too many people away. And we, if, if the Seahawks were rationally coached, they would throw the ball against Tampa Bay. <laughs> but – Assumption of rational coaching is especially not relevant with the, with the way that they've run their offense. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. Yep. <laughs> All right, Eric. I uh, want to thank you for swinging by here once again and talking a little NFL. And uh, we threw a lot of weird stuff at you there. So I appreciate you being a, uh, nimble on your toes, talking some quarterbacks and all that. I appreciate it. Have fun on Halloween. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. You guys too. A lot of fun to, to hang out and chat ball. Absolutely. Thank you. Covering the future. All right. One final thank you goes to Dr. Eric Eager for swinging by and breaking down week nine of the NFL. Follow Eric on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. And, and the thing that I like about Eric is that we can throw him curveballs and ask him about a random array of quarterbacks. And he just knows off the top of his head how they graded out in pro football focus. So uh, it's fun to talk football with him. You know, he knows his stuff. And uh, I think that it's, it's really fun to have guests like that on all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I love talking to Eric. I mean, uh, I was lucky enough. He came up to Ann Arbor for, for Michigan game and we, we spent a couple hours just chatting yeah. football and betting, uh, over some beers, uh, which was great. Yeah. So, uh, just, you know, really fortunate to have him in the football analytics world and, and not professoring like he was before. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's, it's a benefit for all of us. Absolutely. We are all winners for Eric's knowledge. Again, follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. We'll take a look at covering the future in just one second, but Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive in now to covering the future. And Ed, you want to talk about that Patriots and Ravens game? I am obsessed with this game. I want to watch every second of this game. Uh, what is your lean on this one here between the Pats and the Ravens? 
Well, I mean, if it's a Patriots game, you should always lean towards the Patriots, right? I mean, as, I, as a rule I, of thumb, sure. Yeah. Yeah, as a rule of thumb. <laughs> I mean, I think they've covered, I don't know, 50. Three ish percent of the time, yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's it, it's always good when the Patriots kind of have a, a a a bad stretch, yeah. Because then you're actually getting value on it, yeah. Um, you know, where your numbers are kind of when the markets start to doubt them, you know, and Brady's getting old and and whatnot. But you know, I actually had them uh with with good Super Bowl odds before the start of the playoff last year, which I sent out to some of my which I sent out to my members, and you know, was lucky to have that work out. But anyways, you know, the Patriots are 8-0 halfway through the season, and they look pretty invincible. And, you know, they're they're blowing out teams. You know, only the Buffalo game has been within one score. And you don't have to look too hard to find out, you know, why. Uh, the pass defense has been amazing. The only thing bad you can say is that they're second in my adjusted success rate behind San Francisco. Um, so definitely an elite unit. And when you go on PFF and look at the grades, like, the cornerbacks, Stephon Gilmore, Jonathan Jones, Jason McCourty are all grading out so high. So the, the, they have their own no-fly zone there, and and that's a unit that's really going to propel them. But there's some things that I'm kind of watching for with this New England team to see if there's any chinks in the armor. And the first one's kind of obvious. They're plus 17 in turnover margin. Uh, that is unsustainable. Uh, you expect them to be maybe a little bit better than average just because they're winning games and uh, you know when teams are down – tend to throw more and the interception rate gets higher. Um, but you're not going to, you're not going to continue to be plus 17 over a stretch of eight games. And, you know, this really manifests like turnovers really manifest when you look at the the final margin of victory. And so when I first got into this business, I started doing team rankings that take margin of victory and adjust for strength to schedule. I still find that to be a powerful predictor. That metric says that the Patriots are 15 points better than an average NFL team. Yeah, that's too much. Um, the other thing that I'm really looking at is the pass offense. So when I look at success rate on passing plays, they're 15th, which is you know not particularly good. Uh, they actually get downgraded to 19th when I make schedule adjustments. Uh, they haven't faced the best slate of pass defenses. Uh, only Pittsburgh and Cleveland rank in the top half of the NFL uh, when you look at who they faced. So again, the the, the benefits of of the schedule adjustments that I make for success rate. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that 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 Tom Brady is off his game or, or getting old, but there are some interesting comparisons between this year and previous years. So you can look at ADOT, uh, which is average depth of target. So how, uh, how long the ball is in the air. And it, his, it, it, his ADOT is 7.2 yards this year, well, which is 23rd in the NFL. It's lower than it was last year, uh, which was almost eight yards. Of, of air yards so you know is 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 part of it like his completion rates about the same but you know part of it might be that he's just not throwing as deep there's no gronk this year josh gordon's been out and then you know a pff grade of 81 is very good uh but it's also the lowest that they've had for him since since 2013 as well so definitely things i'm looking for the turnover margin what their pass offense does clearly this team can still win a super bowl just on their being carried by their defense like their defense is is that good um but we'll see if there are any chinks in the armor my numbers like uh new england by 3.8 points which actually suggests a lean on new england like i said at the beginning you should always lean towards new england uh and it's gonna be a fantastic game and so you're saying more so long term you want to see how they hold up as we get further into the season yeah for sure i mean i i it, you know it, it the road is definitely gonna get tougher when Mahomes uh, comes back from Kansas City, um, uh, there, there's some interesting hurdles in the AFC. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think you always lean towards uh, Belichick and Brady. But um, just it, it was an interesting exercise to see what what was going on with this team. And Yeah. Number fires numbers are also a bit skeptical of the passing offense, I would say. Uh, David right. Andrews, their center, has been out. Uh, their left tackle, Isaiah Wynn, is on IR. Sounds like he may be one of the guys designated to return, but they've had injuries on the offensive line, and those aren't going to magically fix. Andrews is out for the year, their center. So I think that there are some questions around the offense. Uh, they're, they're Dev, uh, James Devlin, their they're fullback, too. I don't know how much an impact that makes, but they've had some issues, and those haven't shown up because they haven't faced great defense. Now, like Eric said, the Ravens aren't great, and that's why your numbers probably still lean towards the Patriots, but... 
eventually they're going to face good defenses, and I want to see what the Patriots do there. So I think uh, they'll definitely be a team to watch. And Sunday may tell us, but the Ravens' defense isn't that much of a test either. As far as mine goes, I want to talk about the Lions plus two against the Raiders because you look at this game, Derek Carr's been pretty good this year, actually, and I think that they should move the ball on the Lions. But the Raiders, we were talking about center injuries with the Patriots, the Raiders will also play without their their center, Rodney Hudson, this week. Hudson grades out as being pro football focus's third best center overall this year and the second best guy in pass protection. And when you break down the, the nuts and bolts inside Derek Carr's success this year, a lot of his success has been because he has avoided sacks. He should still be pretty good there because their left tackle, Colton Miller, has been much better this year than he was last year. Trent Brown's on the right side, so he should still be okay there. But if he takes a step back in the sack department, it could have a negative impact on this team's offensive efficiency as a whole. Detroit has had its issues against the pass this year, but they're still 13th against the pass based on number fires rankings. Uh, Darius Slay, probably healthier now. So they're not a bad defense, uh, and they should get a bump with Hudson being out. On the other side of the ball, the Raiders are 29th against the pass this year. They have been just gutted by Deshaun Watson and Aaron Rodgers the past two weeks. And yeah, Deshaun Watson and Aaron Rodgers are really good quarterbacks, but Matthew Stafford has been a really good quarterback this year too. He is seventh in per dropback efficiency based on number of fires metrics, and he's actually one spot ahead of Aaron Rodgers in that department for the full season. He is throwing the ball deep a ton. You were talking about the ADOT uh, for Tom Brady. Matthew Stafford has gone the exact opposite direction this year. He is chucking it deep, and it's working out really well when you have guys like Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay on the receiving end. Now, the Lions do go outdoors here, uh, so that efficiency could take a step back, but I still think they're going to move the ball very well here. I think the Lions' money line is in play at plus 116 if you want to go that route, uh, but I also like the spread here. Lions plus two, 72% of the bets and 64% of the money are on the Lions, according to Odds Fire. so this line should hold pretty steady, but I'd be inclined to go grab that one now, uh, regardless, just to be safe. So I like the Lions plus two here, Ed. Uh, what do your numbers say about this game? Yeah, I mean, my my uh, my numbers like it as well. They, I mean, they have Oakland winning by 1.3 points, so definitely suggest the Lions on the side. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the ADOT of, of Stafford. He's, he's third in the NFL, over 10 yards of air yards on average for every time he throws the ball. Uh, all this information is now on pro football, uh, pro, pro, football pro football reference. reference yeah. yeah, so all the sports reference sites uh, now have that. And uh, great resource. And that's what I, that's where I was looking up the ADOT stats for Tom Brady. And that's something that Bob Stoll talked about last week, too, was yep. factoring air yards in. And deep passes are more efficient. Matthew Stafford's throwing deep more often. It should not be a surprise that this offense has been more efficient. So I was down in the Lions entering the year. Their offense has made me feel a lot better about them. So I want the Lions plus two here against the Raiders. Uh, Ed, anything else you, you want to address here before we close up shop for the week? Yeah, I kind of got a funny story. So so last night, my, my wife, she had to go get her nails done. And there was some family drama. And my boys were like, oh, we, we want to go. And I was like, well, crap, I got nothing to do. So the four of us ended up walking into this nail salon and you know we try to sit down next to her but that didn't work and so so my boys are like well, we'll just go sit in the corner and, and watch a show but the place smelled so awful that the three of us could not like help but like holding our noses in there so we sit in there for two minutes and then we're like sorry honey we're gone <laughs> like i don't know how women do it like i know they yeah. got to get their nails done and this is great but like i'm seriously like worried about my wife's health yeah like going and doing this um, it, it just, it, yeah, it was, it was kind of toxic. So that's a Anyways, lot of we, toxins we, to be inhaling. And it's not like you go in for five minutes when you get your nails. It's done. an hour. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't think you want to sniff chemicals broadly. Uh, yeah. maybe you do. I don't know. I don't want to speak for other people, but like, I don't think you want to sniff chemicals <laughs> for five minutes, much less an hour. And I would be frightened. I, I can't I personally like do like manicures and pedicures because if people touch my feet i will kick them accidentally like not on purpose i am just very ticklish and it would not go very well so i keep myself out of that for the safety of others because yeah. i just i don't think i could do that with my feet well and even if i wanted to get my nails done like i'm not sitting in there for an hour man right unless happening. you have like a 
Like even the a nose plug trap. doesn't work because you're still inhaling it. You just don't smell it. Like you're still exactly. inhaling the toxins. Exactly. Right. So is your wife acting a little weird today now, <laughs> or is she good? Well, she does this. She does this like every other week. So right, it's right. A regular thing for her, but I don't know. It's kind of like, eh. That's the problem. Is I look at my toes and I know I could use it. Like I know I could use it <laughs> deep down inside. I'm like. I could use some pampering down there, uh, but I can't do it. Just I, I don't want to kick people in the face, trying to avoid that, yeah. trying to cut that out of my life. So uh, I think that's a valid concern. We'll have to oh, yeah. look deeper into that. Uh, anything else popping for you the rest of the week over at the Power Rank or on the Football Analytics Show? Yeah, I mean, you can always get my newsletter at the Power Rank. But actually, I, I should really plug uh, the guys over at Man vs. Model. It's a podcast, uh, does some college football betting. And they had me on the show this week. We did it last night. And it was super fun. I think it was yeah. a really good show. These guys really put a lot of effort into preparing. Like Jim Sonnet's levels of, <laughs> of preparation into their rundown and what they're going to say. Um, and, you know, it's lighthearted and there's a yeah. lot of joking around. And I don't know. I actually I actually even divulged why I was mad at Bill Connolly. Um <laughs> Which I actually haven't even told Bill, although I doubt it's – it's not like he couldn't figure it out. Um, but it was just a fun conversation. Uh, we talked about Dr. Eric Eager as well and, yeah. and Kevin Cole. And, and so uh, it's, it's man versus model. Uh, okay. It's not out right now, but it should be out by the time this podcast is out. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Okay, interesting. And uh, what, what is the, the concept of the show? It's an interesting title. Yeah, so it's 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 this kind of battle royale between man versus a uh, uh, model. Uh, yeah. um, so William was one of the hosts. He he has his own model, and he he talks about that on the show. And, and some of the other guys come from more traditional betting perspective. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's that's the premise. And they had me on as a guest. And it was super fun. Interesting. I have to check that out just to hear the Bill Connolly story because I'm very interested in that. <laughs> you can find all of Ed's work over at thepowerrank.com. You can follow him on Twitter at The Power Rank and find his other podcast, The Football Analytics Show, wherever you get your podcasts. I am at Jim Sonnes on Twitter, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. We put up our DFS Week 9 preview podcast with myself and Brandon Gadulia. Gadula. Earlier today, you can check that out by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. And you can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for keeping us on the air from a video perspective here today. Thank you always as Cal for doing that. And thank you to everyone for tuning in for this week's episodes of Covering the Spread. Again, Week 10 College Football went up, talking with Ed about his adjusted success rate numbers. You can find that by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts and leaving a rating and review while you are there. Good luck with your bets in Week 10 and Week 9, and we'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 